this kind of momentum stuff should really be review for you guys so you notice that we're moving quite quickly throughout the chapter with these examples so one type of problem that gets done a lot with momentum is these things we call collision and in these cases we have multiple bodies within our system coming together and crashing together and then so that's time one some time later they hit each other and now they are going off in different places and the nice thing about this kind of setup is the only force that are acting on the various body is all contained within the system so what makes these things particularly nice is there's no external forces which also means that there is no external impulses right because that's equal to your external force times delta t so even though we don't know how much time it takes for the collision to happen it doesn't really matter because the force is zero so the overall momentum change is zero so that we can say that our total initial momentum of the system is equal to the total final momentum of the system making the math quite easy because that's what it means for momentum to be conserved when there's no interaction to the outside that amount of stuff in this case momentum remains constant additionally this question also talks about specifically elastic collision and we talk about these words like elastic inelastic that's a statement about the amount of kinetic energy within the system because in all cases momentum is conserved by definition and in these collision cases there's no external force so the momentum stays constant but as the two things crash into each other it's possible some of that kinetic energy gets transferred into most likely thermal energy though it's often possible you get some sound and for really really energetic collision you might even get light so the descriptor elastic specifically refers to that somehow these things collide the system maintains and keep a hundred percent of the kinetic energy within the system and these mostly happens during subatomic kind of collision because for any macroscopic thing it's likely that the particles as it collides together compress a little bit and you generate a little bit of uh, thermal energy if it's anything less than 100% we classify that as inelastic to be a little more specific the final kinetic energy is less than 100% of the initial kinetic energy there's a special case here uh, just now that we're on this discussion let's complete it <clears throat> completely inelastic it's not necessary that the final kinetic energy is zero because that's not always possible because you still have to make sure the momentum statement is satisfied but rather completely inelastic refers to when the total final kinetic energy is at a minimum and that minimum happens when in the end all the bodies are stuck together your textbook additionally introduced one more type in here which they call explosion in which two things get energy from somewhere else say the chemical energy of an explosive and different parts of the body pushes off one another so you could possibly have more kinetic energy to end up with than you started with so a bit of a review there let's get back to the question we're talking about elastic collision so what we know is this line total system momentum before and after is the same and also we know this line that your total kinetic energy to begin with is equal to total kinetic energy to end up with so this gives us two separate equations to work from and personally I find this question a little bit interesting because we're talking about something that's fairly light hitting something that's really heavy so we can kind of see what happens when a really light things even though it might be coming really fast hits a very heavy thing they didn't specifically give us the masses here but given this atomic number we can get pretty close I mean there's some percentage of variation but we're gonna use atomic mass units which is roughly speaking the mass of one proton or one neutron you can of course look up the specific masses for these nuclei but this will get us close enough 
for our purposes. So let's then draw a before and after picture. Now, because we have multiple bodies and multiple times, your subscript becomes quite important. So that's VHE1. Assuming everything's one dimensional, we have VU2. And since I don't quite know what the alpha part goes doing, let's assume that it still goes in what we're going to define as the positive direction. If it ends up being negative, then we know to flip it around. So if we were to draw free body diagrams during the collision, they hit each other. Both of these are internal forces, so they're not external forces. That's the main thing because then this still has to be satisfied. If you want a little tables, but in this case, there's not a lot of information they're giving to us. We don't quite know what the initial speed is. We definitely don't know what the final speeds are. And then we only know that the uranium was initially stationary. So after all that, let's write out our two possible equations and see what we can do with these things. And of course, even mass needs subscripts because now we have more than one body. So well in here, we more or less have three unknowns, but in this case, I just want a ratio of percentage. So we can put everything in terms of one of the unknowns. So that's still two that we have to work with. So therefore we need another equation and that's gonna come from the elastic collision bit. The initial total kinetic energy is equal to the final. Right now we have two equations here for the two unknowns. So we do a bunch of math and everything's gonna work out. So let's do a bunch of math. From the first equation, we can solve for one of the things in terms of the other. In the end, we want to relate the kinetic energy of the uranium nucleus after with the kinetic energy of the alpha particle before, right? So this is referring to VU2 compared to V alpha particle one. So the th one out of the three to eliminate would be the VHE2. So let's isolate for that so we can sub it into the next one and get rid of it. And once we have this thing, we can sub it back over here and get a lengthier expression, but one that is solvable. I will try to speed through this. We square the top and square the bottom, but then the bottom, one of the bottom cancels with this one, expanding that square and multiplying this MHG over. Remember that we need the FOIL method, so don't forget the very important middle term. And that last MHG is from multiplying from the denominator. Couple things go away. This cancels over that. Oh, that's nice because everywhere else has a VU2 term. So we can actually factor that part out. Zero is equal to VU2, a bunch of things. So then given these two things multiply together to get you zero, either this bit is zero or this whole long thing is zero. So this first thing would be zero if basically the two particles don't interact at all, right? If the alpha particle pass right by and the uranium continues to be staying still, that's a valid solution to the whole situation, not the one we're interested in. So we don't care about that one. What we do know is zero is then equal to that whole mess. And then we can again factor out my VU2. Subtracting over and dividing by that so that we can get VU2 in terms of the initial alpha particle speed. And you notice all these terms have U square in it, so those can go away. And we get 3% of the initial speed of the uh, helium nucleus. Side note, now that we have this number, we could go back and work out the final velocity of the alpha particles, it's negative 97%. So you can see when something light hits something really heavy, it bounces pretty much straight back with a lot of speed, whereas the heavy object ends up moving fairly slowly. And that's hopefully typical of what 
might have experienced in real life. For finally finishing the question, we want this particular ratio. The one half goes away. Those cancels as well. The square still applies to the decimal. The atomic mass unit also goes away. And there's the ratio, which is about 6.6%. .6%. The heavy object only picks up a small chunk of the kinetic energy because most of the kinetic energy has to remain in the smaller object as it bounces backwards. So the math was a little lengthy, but the main takeaway is setting up the two equations that for collision, this is true. And then in the particular case of an elastic collision, this is true, giving us a second equation.